Hello and welcome. The topic of this lecture is uh, Goodman's new riddle of induction, which is uh, one of the most creative and interesting arguments in the history of philosophy, to say nothing of the philosophy of the last hundred years. Uh, the author of this argument is a fellow by the name of Nelson Goodman. He lived from 1906 to 1998, spent most of his career at the University of Pennsylvania, later Harvard. Um, and uh, this argument itself is from a book called Fact, Fiction, and Forecast, which was reprinted quite a number of times, as you can see here. Um, Goodman uh, spent most of his career uh, doing uh, uh, work in, in aesthetics, uh, and so uh, the structure of appearance and languages of art are, are some of uh, the works that are more in his um, you know sort of traditional uh, wheelhouse, where he spent most of his work. But again, Fact, Fiction, and Forecast was a very uh, important book, uh, and uh, a chapter of it right about in the middle uh, is, uh, is is where we get this new riddle of induction. In order to take a look at the new riddle of induction, it helps to do a bit of review on the problem of induction, or what we'll soon call the old problem of induction. Uh, this is the problem that was described by David Hume originally, uh, also described by Bertrand Russell in the chapter titled On Induction of uh, Russell's book, The Problems of Philosophy. So remember, induction, right, the way that we use the term in this context, uh, means a, a process of reasoning where you use what you have experienced to form beliefs about what you haven't experienced. So uh, if you see an apple sitting on a pile of apples in the grocery store, you have an idea about what it's going to taste like, even though you haven't actually tasted it. And the belief you have about what that apple tastes like uh, or will taste like is uh, based on your experience of similar things previously. Okay, and so uh, that's that's induction. That's the using using induction to reason. And so the problem of induction is that the assumption that when we assume that what is beyond our experience, that is what we haven't experienced, will resemble what we have experienced, uh, lacks a solid justification. Uh, the idea is that, well, look, you know, previously, you know, the apples that I have tasted like I thought they would, he's like, yes, but um, assuming you, you have to assume that the future will be relevantly like the past. In, in order to support this. And the only reason we think that the future will be like the past is because so far it has. Um, and so we, we can't use the uh, same principle to justify itself. So in other words, no amount of experience fully justifies our expectations about the nature of what we have not experienced, right? It could always be different, right? Uh, there could always be some reason that we're not aware of why our previous experience is no longer a guide. Uh, in fact, we we have plenty of such experiences where where we uh, you know that that in where we experience something and that just sort of invalidates our, our prior experience and means it's no longer a guide to the future. That that's that's depressingly routine. So in in any case, that's the old problem of induction. That's the problem that Russell and uh, Hume focused on, among others. Before moving to Goodman's new riddle of induction, uh, I want to talk a little bit about some approaches for making the old problem of induction seem like it's not so bad. Uh, some of the some of the methods that arose between uh, between Hume and our present uh, that have caused at least some uh, uh, thinkers not to worry so much about this problem of induction. The way I'd like to explain this uh, kind of reasoning, essentially this is Bayesian reasoning, if, if, that's, a, if that's a term you know, if, if not, don't worry about it. Um, but I want you to imagine that you have a, a sack of marbles, right? And, and the sack of marbles is going to be akin to, in some sense, the universe for us. Imagine a very big sack of marbles, right? And the idea is that we, we, we experience uh, the universe, you know, essentially one experience at a time. And the more experiences we have, uh, the more sure or the more confident we get about what the experiences we haven't yet had will be like. As in, we get more and more confident that the future will resemble the past, even though the only reason we think that the future will resemble the past is that so far the future has resembled the past, right? Um, th th there just isn't any guarantee that it will continue to do so in all respects. So, but, so imagine that you do then have this sack of marbles. 
Uh, and imagine you start drawing marbles out one at a time, right? So again, this is this is a, a kind of a metaphor for for you know again having an experience of the world, having an experience of the way things are. And the idea is that the more marbles you draw to the bag, you might start to develop expectations about what kind of marbles are in the bag, that is the ones that you haven't yet seen. Um, but those expectations may again occasionally be violated. So if you're if you're looking uh, here um, at uh, uh, at, at uh, th this this kind of a, a distribution of marbles, you might say, well, look, I expect that almost all the marbles in there are green, but of course, then you get uh, this sort of odd red one that maybe violates your expectations. But you know, the the idea is the more the more marbles you pull out, the more you you get some idea of what's in there. Even if your experience is a lot more heterogeneous, that is, you know, you see, you see lots of different kinds of things you regularly experience, uh, you, you start to say, well, look, there, there appear to only be three kinds of marbles we can pull out of this bag if you've pulled enough of them out, right? Um, and uh, so that's uh, what, what that does is it starts to, to form expectations, right? Um, and so in some ways this sort of states the old problem of induction right the notice that you, you never really know which kind of marble is coming out of the bag next despite the fact that you have expectations right psychological expectations about about what you you think you're going to pull out of there there's no guarantee uh, that, that the next marble will meet any of your expectations uh, but the more marbles you pull out the more you know you can you can get more or less confident about these expectations and the idea is then that as you uh, get more or less confident in these kinds of expectations, uh, it turns out that drawing more marbles out of the bag really does actually do something. Even if it doesn't fully justify uh, your expectations, even if it doesn't fully justify you in saying definitely what's in the bag or definitely what's coming out of the bag next, it, it does give you good reasons to be more or less confident about certain options. So again, each because each marble removed from the bag does provide a better and better picture of what was in the bag. And so the totality of the marbles out of the bag would provide a better and better picture of what's likely to still be there. So, so it does seem as if repeated experience gives you something, uh, even if that something isn't certainty. It does seem to be, it does seem to at least give you greater confidence. Um, like I said, it's never a guarantee, but the point is that, you know, the, 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 you get something out of, out of induction. You at least get some sort of justified sense of confidence about what the next things to come out of the bag are, even if you never know for sure. And so what that does is it, again, erodes the old problem of induction a little bit. It, it, it sort of, it makes, um, it makes it a little bit less of a problem. Um, and so again, it's these kinds of, of, of Bayesian methods that have uh, uh, over between between Hume and our present, uh, you know, sort of eroded how bad people thought the problem of induction really was. And uh, in case you uh, are not familiar with um, uh, the, the term Bayesian, uh, this is just a, a, a very quick rundown. Uh, this is this is Thomas Bayes, uh, who's generally credited uh, with uh, coming up with this form of reasoning. Um, and I'm not going to go over this formula and everything. Um, it's a, just a little bit beyond the scope of this particular lecture. I'm just going to mention it so that you can know enough to, to sort of look it up and learn a little bit about it, because it is very interesting. Basically, what Bayes' theorem is, is it's a formula for deciding in a mathematical way how much your confidence in uh, in something should change uh, given new evidence about that thing right and it's a it's a it's a very powerful method that actually ends up uh, contributing to solving all kinds of real practical problems and uh, again this is the kind of reasoning that is this thought to sort of erode uh, a hume's uh, problem old problem of induction well, um, enter Goodman here. Uh, this is where, where, where Nelson Goodman's going to come onto our stage. And uh, he starts off uh, the chapter with, uh, this is just a quote from his from his book, right, uh, from, from Fact, Fiction, and Forecast, uh, from the chapter titled The New Riddle of Induction. And uh, he puts it this way. He says, that a given piece of copper conducts electricity increases the credibility of statements asserting that other pieces of copper conduct electricity and thus confirms the hypothesis that all con copper conducts electricity. But the fact that a given man now in this room is a third son 
does not increase the credibility of statements asserting that other men now in this room are third sons, and so does not confirm the hypothesis that all men now in this room are third sons. Yet in both cases, our hypothesis is a generalization of the evidence statement. Okay. Now this warrants some, some sitting and thinking about for a minute because what he uh, illustrates for us is actually quite a very interesting problem. It's a problem that you have probably never thought about in your entire life, but that doesn't mean it's not a real problem. And in fact, the fact that most people never think about this problem uh, means it's actually quite interesting and, and, and you know possibly <laughs> really quite important. And so what Goodman says is, he says, look, if you find one piece of copper and, and then verify that it does conduct electricity, that's taken to support, right? That's taken as evidence for the fact that all copper conducts electricity. So if somebody says, well, what makes you think that? Well, you, can, you can point to this as an instance. You say, well, this is confirmation, right? But then, you know, if you say, look, all the men in this room are third sons, right? And you say, well, on, on what basis do you say that? It's like, well, this one is, right? You know, and so... It's, it sounds completely right to use a, a one piece of copper to justify claims about all pieces of copper and seems so ridiculous, right, to say, well, look, because one person I'm talking to is a third son, therefore they must all be in this room, right? I mean, or, or so the question is why? Why is, is, is one piece of copper an evidence for all copper, but one person in the room is not any kind of evidence for all people? It, um, it's, it's a it's a little weird, right? And, you know, you're, if you're tempted to say, well, look, there are, you know, natural laws or things like that. I mean, that's where, where Goodman is going to be going with this, but I, you should stop for a moment and really think along with him. And I will say, I, I do sort of wish he'd chosen a slightly different example because, of course, it's not logically possible for everybody to be a third son. You have to have first and second sons in order to have third sons. So it's a little weird in that sense. Uh, but you might say something like this, like, why is one encountering one piece of copper that conducts electricity evidence that all copper conducts electricity but running into one person who's you know a, a gemini right uh is not um evidence that that they all are right i mean and and you know because logically it's possible for all 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 men to be gemini's or something like that um that I mean, again, it's an interesting question. It's a question you've probably never thought of anything anything like that. Uh, but then, you know, if you want to try and explain the difference between these two things, one of the things that basically everyone's going to say is something something like the following, right? Um, they're going to say something like, the difference is that in the former case, that is the copper, the hypothesis is a law-like statement, right? It seems like we're describing laws of nature here, right? While in the latter case, the one with the third sons or whatever, um, the hypothesis is a merely contingent or accidental generality. Only a statement that is law-like, regardless of its truth or falsity or its scientific importance, is capable of receiving confirmation from an instance of it. Accidental statements are not. Plainly, then, we must look for a way of distinguishing law-like from accidental statements. Right. And so, again, that, that sounds like a, a, a fun thing, but, but why, why is this copper conducts electricity more law-like than, you know, uh, this man as a Gemini, right? I, I, is there something, there's nothing in the grammar of either of those sentences. There's nothing in the vocabulary of either of those sentences. They both seem to just say, here's, here's an individual and here's a property and this a property applies to that individual. It, um, it seems, it seems weird, right? We want to say like, what, what is it that really distinguishes law-like statements from non-law-like statements? You know, why do we treat some things as evidence for the general, you know, for generality and, and other things we don't? It's, um, it's a little mysterious. And so here's an example that then uh, uh, Goodman cooks up. Basically, uh, I'll spoil this a little bit. Basically, he's cooking up this example to eventually show that this idea of distinguishing between law-like and, and accidental statements just isn't going to work, right? Or at least that uh, uh, things that appear to be law-like are going to have some very serious conceptual problems, uh, uh, just like just like any other claim. And so here's here's his example, and this is this is the, the the main example, the key example, the the example around which the whole argument is going to revolve. And so again, I'm putting it in Goodman's words, keeping it in Goodman's words here. Goodman uh, then writes, he says, suppose then that all emeralds examined before a certain time t are green, 
At time t, then, our observations support the hypothesis that all emeralds are green. And again, if that doesn't sound law-like in, in, in the way that con copper conducts electricity sounds law-like, then I don't know what does. So he continues, he says, and this is in accord with our definition of confirmation. Our evidence statements assert that emerald A is green, emerald B is green, and so on, and each confirms the general hypothesis that all emeralds are green. So far, so good. Okay, when a philosopher says that, you need to wait for the other shoe to drop, and so here it goes. So here's the wrinkle that Goodman will introduce. He says, now let me introduce another predicate less familiar than green. Okay, and so again, he's going to say, let's let's talk about a property. So so being green, greenness is a property that things can have. And so what Goodman is going to do here is he's going to invent an, a different property that some object could have. And in this case, it's a color term uh, that, uh, or, or the predicate in this case, is, is the predicate grew. Okay, and it applies to all things examined before time t just in case they are green, but to other things just in case they are blue. Okay, um, and, and again, that's exactly how Goodman put it. I think, you know, there, there are maybe clearer ways to articulate that, but the idea is that grew means essentially uh, green prior to time t and blue afterward, hence this, you know, sort of portmanteau-y looking grew. Um, and if you're like, if you're thinking at this point that this is a very strange predicate, fine, right? It, it, granted, right? But but it is a predicate. It has a definition, and so uh, we're going to say, you know, if some if something actually is grew, then it's true to say that it's grew. If something is green, it's true to say that it's green. That's that's a there's a there's a different color. Um, and so now what we want to do is we want it we want to start looking at the relationships between our evidence statements and uh, you know. Uh, sort of overall conditions that our evidence statements point to. And so if it was true that all emeralds really were green, okay, again, that that, that law-like, you know, statement. So you see one emerald is green, you see another emerald is green, you see a third emerald is green, and that tells you that the, all that supports the idea that all emeralds are green, okay? Notice that's induction, Right, that's that's the inductive process. You if you see a certain number of emeralds and they all turn out to be the same color, well then, you know that means that that you know that all emeralds must be that color, right? Or that each each new emerald you find that's that color, supports the claim that all emeralds are that color. And so in this case, we're going to start with green. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you an image, and this here, okay, look at it, look at it carefully, uh, is is what it would look like, right? This is what our evidence would be like if all emeralds really were green, right? That is, this emerald would, would look this way, this one would look this way, this one would look the way it looks, this one would look this way, etc. Each of these would look however they look, you know, they, they would look, you know, green, for lack of a better word. And so, there we go. Now, now I need to uh, introduce this, again, less familiar predicate, uh, and so think to yourself, uh, I, want, I want to really think to yourself uh, before before I, I move on here, pause the video if you have to, what would emeralds look like if they were grew? And now let's say that this, so remember the definition of grew is uh, green before time T and, and blue uh, afterward, okay? And let's say that time T is tomorrow at 3.30, right, uh, p.m., uh, so let's just let's just stipulate that time t is tomorrow at you know 3:30 p.m. So now think to yourself, what would emeralds look like if they were grew? That is, if they really did fit the definition that that is grew, right? Green prior to time t, that is tomorrow at 3:30 p.m. Um, and uh, blue afterward. Okay. So if you are thinking, well, they'd look just the same, wouldn't they? That that's correct. That's the correct answer. If you didn't say that, go back a couple of slides and and try this again, right? Until you understand why this is what emeralds would look like if they were grew, right? Emerald A would look like this. Emerald B would look like this. Emerald C would look like this, etc. Right, all the way through. Um, that and so. Uh, notice that our evidence for, this, this is the important part, our evidence for saying that all emeralds are green is what emeralds look like so far, 
right? And, and that's, that's here. Our evidence for saying that all emeralds are gru, which is not the same color as green. Green is one color. Gru is a different color, okay? Our evidence for saying that all emeralds are gru is just exactly the same as our evidence for saying that they're all green. That should be, I think you should start to see the problem now, right? So if, if our evidence doesn't tell us the difference between emeralds being green and emeralds being gru, well then maybe that's a problem with our evidence, right? That, that, and, and of course, is looking at more emeralds gonna, gonna fix the problem? Of course not, right? Uh, our evidence is ambiguous, right? Between saying that all emeralds are green and saying that all emeralds are gru. Right? They would all look the same in either case. Right? So our evidence equally supports both of these claims. Equally supports both of these claims. Okay? And so then the question, the, question, the question is, what good's our evidence? What good is our past experience if this is the case? But it gets worse. <sighs> Think about now what emeralds would look like if they were grink. And again, let's define the predicate grink as green prior to time t and uh, pink afterward. Okay, and again, let's just stipulate that time t is tomorrow at 3.30 p.m. So what would emeralds look like if they were all grink? Right? And again, if you're thinking this, they've looked just exactly the same as they've always looked, uh, then that is correct. Okay, and so... Now we have three claims that our evidence cannot tell the difference between. Our evidence equally supports the idea that all, all emeralds are green, that all emeralds are grew, and that all emeralds are grink. And Grello, okay, second verse same as the first, or in this case the third, third verse same as the first two. Um, yeah, no, and so now we have um, we have four claims that our evidence can't tell the difference between. How how about five? Um, what about um, Gerbil, right? Uh, again, same same story. That's six, etc. Okay, and so the, the upshot is if 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 we can just keep going, right, with and and, and generating all these these uh, you know uh, different color terms that uh, that are all supported by our evidence, that is by our experience, by the way that things look to us. Um, the question is if if the evidence is just as good as support for all emeralds are Gru as it is for all emeralds are Grink or Grello or Grautruse, etc. If the evidence is equally good for all of those things, including all emeralds are green, why privilege green, right? Is it only because the term green is just more familiar to us? Is that the only reason we prefer it? And that's the important question to ask. He's like, well, of course, you know, like those other colors are made up or something. You're going to say something like that, but that's um, uh, that's not going to work. That's not going to get you out of the trouble. Um, but think to yourself, like, again, why? Why should the predicate green, why should the color term green be the one that, be the one out of all of these that the evidence equally well supports that, uh, you know, the, 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 that's, that's the thing that the evidence confirms, as opposed to any of these other things that the evidence really does also equally well confirm. And if you're being sort of, you know, even relatively fair-minded, you'll see the problem. And so, um, because again, we do have exactly the same evidence. It's not, you know, it, there's, there's no difference at all, right, in favor of Gru and those other things as we do for Green. Um, it is exactly the same evidence. And so at this point, you might just say, yeah, 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 but Gru is made up, okay? And, and these are some objections that uh, Nelson Goodman himself uh, anticipated and, and makes, in a sense, the correct answer here. And uh, some of these are supplemented uh, by, um, you know, by myself, but uh, it's, it's fine. So if, you, if you're thinking, look, look, we can't, you know, Gru is just a made up word, and that's why all emeralds are really green um, instead of, you know, Gru or Grink or Grack or et cetera, right? Um, he's like, yeah, you can't have, you can't use made up words. If that's a new rule, well, th here's a trouble, right? So is, the, so is emerald, okay? <laughs> the word emerald is made up, uh, but you didn't object to that word being used in the argument. Um, all words are made up to some extent. All language is conventional. And in fact, much of the language of science, which I think you're going to say is law-like, most of those terms are, are made up or had to be made up by somebody. 
Uh, and so, for example, uh, if you think about, if we think back to the copper example, when we say that copper conducts electricity, well, that def that that use of the word conduct, as in allows electricity to move through it, that's a totally made up usage of that word, right? There are other things you can use that word to mean, but um, but the, the the usage in electro in electronics is is made up, right? And because the reason we made that word up or made that word apply to that concept is because it was a new concept. We didn't have any, we didn't have a word for, for objects that would allow electricity to pass through them. In fact, we didn't have a word for electricity before we kind of knew more or less what it was. Uh, so uh, again, all words are to a greater or lesser extent made up. And so it's saying that grew is a made up word and therefore this argument is bad or something. It's, it's not, that's not going to work. Um, that's, that's a, uh, that's not going to get us anywhere. But you might say, instead of saying, well, it's made up, saying, oh, fine, fine, maybe it's not, you know, maybe, maybe all words are to some extent made up, but um, but grew is silly. And and, and I'll, oh, yes, yes, it is. Okay. Um, it's purposely silly. Okay. Because the point that Goodman is trying to make here is, I think, much more easily and clearly made if you can't tell the difference between what your evidence for a silly claim is versus your evidence for a very familiar claim, right? And so, if again, if the problem was that our evidence supported two reasonable alternatives, it would not be obvious that really there was a problem. It is only because our evidence also supports outlandish alternatives that it is really clear that there's a problem. OK, so, um, you know, look, is it possible that emeralds are some, you know, aren't exactly green the way that we conventionally think about green, but are actually something else that, you know, is sort of scientifically technical or something like that? It's like, imagine that, that I, we'd put the argument that way. You'd be like, OK, yeah, I guess fine, you know, but um, but no, then it wouldn't be as obvious what the problem is. The problem is that uh, we can't restrict the number of things that your evidence really does support. Right, all of every emerald you've ever seen supports the idea that all emeralds are green, and that they're all grack, or and that they're all grink, and that they're all grello, and that they're all grew. I mean, these are, these are these are just your evidence is equally good for each of those conclusions, and because those conclusions are explicitly silly, um, that should tell you that that your experience is not helping you. Your experience is not actually giving you reasons to believe things, or at least not reasons to believe just one thing, and that is just the one thing you sort of think it does. And so if you've progressed beyond this and, and said, yes, 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 but the thing that's making all the trouble is this weird time stamp in, in the, 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 the word grew, right? You know, what kind of a weird term is that where it says it's something, you know, some one color up to a certain time T and then it's some other color and, you know, all this crazy things, right? Um, now, uh, again, this is an argument that Goodman anticipates and he provides a both completely correct and tremendously creative and insightful counter argument, right? He, you know, he says that that actually that's not a problem. And so in order to explain Goodman's reply to this idea that the problem, like that, that, that Gru has this goofy timestamp in it, and that's why we can just sort of ignore his argument. Um, he, he, imagine this, okay? Um, when you tell someone who speaks another language, let's say Japanese, uh, what some English word means, Again, in what language do you have to put your definition, you know, in order for them to understand? Right? Well, it seems like you'd have to put it in Japanese. Right? So, uh, like, otherwise, they wouldn't be able to understand. So, if you, if you'd have to say, in Japanese, the English word green means, you know, yada, yada, yada. Um, and, uh, you know, actually for, for, for an interesting thing, you should consider translating green into Japanese and blue into Japanese and, and tell me what happens. Contrary wise, when you tell an English speaker, uh, what the, the meaning of a word in Japanese is in what language do you have to put the definition? Of course, the answer is English. You would have to say something like, uh, the classical Japanese verb zuchigiri means to test out one's sword on a chance wayfarer, right? Um, Again, the definition is, has to be in English if you speak English, if you want to know what that Japanese word means, right? And so think of it this way. Imagine there's another language called Goodmanese that's a lot like English in a lot of ways, but their color terms are, are pretty different. But imagine this is a natural language like any other. It's a language people growing, grow up speaking, and they use these terms, and you know they use them all the time. 
And so in a sense, what if you want to know what some of these Goodmanese words mean, say, for example, their color terms, you have to put the, the definition into English. And so the Goodmanese term grew, right, in English means green when observed before time t and blue at all other times. I'm going to add one to here. Bleen, right, this Goodmanese term bleen, uh, it means, again, in English means blue when observed before time t and green at all other times. Now, imagine you're an English speaker, right, and you're looking at this and you're saying, my gosh, you have the weirdest color terms in the world in Goodmanese. And, and, and they they are going to say, instead of, yeah, yeah, I know it's weird, uh, they're going to say, what do you mean? Weird, weird how? Right? What, in what way are our color terms weird? Right? They're going to ask you that. And you're going to say, oh, you have this weird time stamp, this thing about being observed before time to you. And they say, no, we don't. <laughs> we don't have that. We, they're just grooves. If something grew, it's grew. And if something's bleen, it's bleen. Uh, we use the color terms the same way you do. And they'll be right. Okay, uh, because the idea is that if, if they, they, they're going to say, well, look, if you think our color terms are weird, what are your color terms? And then you're going to have to describe to them, right, in Goodmanese, what your color terms mean to you. Okay, so that means define the term green and blue right? The, the English terms that you think there's nothing wrong with at all. You think there's nothing funny about green and blue. Uh, and, 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 and think for a minute about how you're going to have to communicate to a good mini speaker what green and blue actually mean. Right? And again, pause the video if, you, if, if necessary. You, you should be able to come up with this. And, and if you don't, again, go back a slide and, and try it again. Um, well, okay. Green right, means grew when observed before time t and bleen at all other times. Blue means bleen when observed before time t and grew at all other times. And when you explain to the speaker of good manies what your color terms, your normal color terms, green and blue, mean, they'll look at you like you're insane and say, those are the weirdest color terms I've ever heard. What's with that weird timestamp in them? And you're going to say, well, we don't have a timestamp in our color terms. That's just something we have to put in there to translate into yours, right? When they, of course, can, can make the very same defense. They don't have a timestamp in, in their color terms. They, that's just something they have to put in there in order to translate their color terms into your language. And so it turns out that, that, that this whole timestamp thing is just an artifact of translation. There's nothing actually crazy about any of these color terms. There's no actual timestamp in there. It's, again, it's just an artifact of translation. And so you might say, look, are you telling me that stuff just changes color randomly? Well, yes. I mean, look around. What world have you been living in? Yes, things change color all the time, right? I'm like, I'm sure you can, if you think about it, what kinds of things change color, right? I mean, you can come up with a list of 100 things long before, before you know, before lunch. Um, yeah, stuff changes color all the time. So again, if you're going to object, if, if that's your objection, it's a ridiculous objection. Stuff really does actually change color. Um, but at the same time, let's think about this. Let's think about what it means to say that things change color or don't change color. So imagine uh, I have I have a, a coffee mug, right? And that's what it looked like yesterday. That's what it looks like today. And this is what it looks like tomorrow. Just imagine we could see all these things at the same time. Imagine we're like Kurt Vonnegut's Tralfamadorians. And if you don't get that reference, look it up. Um, and so, <coughs> uh, incidentally, uh, this is the uh, the the Fiesta Wear coffee mug. Um, that's uh, it's it's adorable, um, but uh, my wife and I used to have some of these. And and this little this little ring shaped um, uh, handle on them, it's it's cute, but it's very impractical because you can't quite fit two fingers into there. And so then if you can only fit one finger, you have to squeeze it really tight with your thumb on this part here, or else the the you know the mug is going to sort of like tip, right? And if you want to keep it from tipping, you have to sort of put a knuckle on the mug, which is hot. That's the whole reason you have a handle is to keep yourself from having to touch the the mug proper. And it's um, they're very impractical practical we stopped using them but they are they are they're cute um, so anyway imagine this is what my mug looked like yesterday today and tomorrow okay so the question is did it change color well one answer you can give is no it was green the whole time notice though you could completely and with, with total consistency say well look no it did change color and I have evidence that it changed color 
see if it were grew yesterday and today and then changed color right tomorrow to green that's what it would look like right and so that's a second hypothesis one hypothesis it didn't change color it was green the whole time second hypothesis it changed color once between today and tomorrow from grew to green and the evidence for that claim that hypothesis that's hypothesis number two right is is what it looked like yesterday today and tomorrow also consider hypothesis three it changed co it changes color every day right it was grew yesterday green today green tomorrow and my evidence for that is look what it looks like see and so again even just to ask the question does this mug change color what the mug looked like yesterday today and tomorrow um supports the hypothesis that it did not change color it supports the hypothesis that it changed color once and supports the hypothesis that it changed color twice so again what use is our experience if it could confirm some indefinitely large number of things one more example do things change color yes right you've I'm, i assume experienced bananas and so you want to say did this banana change color going from this to this to this and of course i have to apologize a little bit so i have these uh the, the right-handed bananas here for green and yellow and then the brown one's a left-handed banana a right-handed banana is one that curves to the right right and then uh, the left-handed banana of course uh, is curving here to the left i just didn't find a brown banana that was right-handed that i uh, that i liked the picture of it just you know or the, they'd all have been right-handed bananas this is a thing though if you're ever purchasing say a banana slicer uh, from amazon or other places uh, make sure to check the reviews to see which hand which hand the slicer is because if you tend to have left-handed bananas in your area but then you buy a right-handed banana slicer it's never gonna gonna match up properly okay in any case hypothesis one is that the banana changed color from green to yellow to brown right well and and our evidence for that hypothesis is we'll just look what happened for at various times okay uh but what happened our, our evidence for saying no no no, it didn't change color it was growl on the whole time okay what's our evidence for saying that well same thing and so again if our evidence just equally confirms right more than one hypothesis um then what's what's what good's the evidence doing right and and of course it's not just that it can confirm more than one hypothesis it's that it can confirm basically an infinite number of hypotheses that is the new problem of induction or, or goodman's new riddle of induction you can put it this way if every piece of experience could confirm some indefinitely large number of possibilities in fact that's not just every piece of experience it's every set of experience it's every you know whole body of experience if every whole body of cons of experience could confirm some indefinitely large number of different possibilities or hypotheses then it seems like our experience doesn't really confirm anything right or, or you know it's a sort of a worse problem it's not that our, our our induction doesn't does it's not that induction doesn't do enough it's that it sort of can confirm any number of things it can confirm an infinite number of things it does too much in that sense that's even worse so one of the things i wanted to uh talk about are, are some of the ways that this kind of an argument really does apply uh to some some real things um because a lot of times when people see this argument they think it's it's just some kind of a magic trick or you know just like a word game or something like that and that really does a disservice to the argument you're not taking it seriously enough if that's how you're you're, you're thinking of this and so again i want to try and help you uh, you know get past that kind of an underestimation of the force of this argument so first i want to talk about underdetermination right because that's going to be a really important concept here uh underdetermination right is the is the idea that even if all of of the of evidence all evidence what were available it's still not it still might not be sufficient to confirm or refute some theory okay um and so uh, uh again our ideas the, the point is that our ideas about the laws of nature uh, might be underdetermined by any available evidence that is imagine that we have all the experience that it's possible to have right that might still underdetermine the 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 why why it's that way 
Um, so think of it this way for, for a second. Um, Newton, for example, thought that gravity was a force, right? Uh, Einstein does not think that gravity is a force. Einstein thinks that gravity is a um, uh, is 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 a, a, about the curvature of space time. Well, to a certain extent, um, you know, no matter how many objects you pick up and drop or throw into the air and you know or or you know put into orbit around another body or do the various things you do with the fact of gravitation, uh, it may be that that the the totality of all those experiences doesn't tell you whether gravity is a force or whether it's a byproduct of the curvature of space time, right? So it may be that all of our experience could underdetermine those two things. Now, as it turns out. Right, physicists have some reason why they think that that uh, you know Einstein was was correct about this you know more so than Newton because there are some ways in which those things can come apart and be tested or whatever. But um, uh, our theories of gravitation notoriously don't play nice with with some of the rest of our physical theories, and so uh, it does still create quite a problem in physics. And so I want to give you an example of underdetermination that doesn't require any specific specific scientific knowledge, right? And that I hope will get the point across, because the idea is in in science what we're doing is we're taking a look at the world. We're we're seeing what happens when we do this, when we do that. Uh, we're cataloging what we observe in this case, what we observe in that case, and then we're trying to make rules out of it. We're trying to generalize rules. We say, okay, well, if we see a follow b, you know, or sorry, if we see B follow A, uh, time after time after time after time after time, yeah, maybe maybe we can say it's a rule that if A then B, right? Um, that's the idea. And um, there might be a real, we might, we just might have a real problem with underdetermination. And so here's an example, a, a fairly simple abstract example. So consider the number sequence two, four, six, eight, you know, dot, dot, dot. Imagine it keeps going. Consider how many possible formulae, that is, how many possible rules, laws, you might say, could have generated that sequence, right? And again, it's worth pausing the video and, and, and making a list, right? And and I think you'll see pretty quickly, once you get, you're probably going to get, okay, count by even numbers, right? And then if you stopped there, it's like, come on, be more imaginative, right? There's more than one way to do that. You say, okay, well, how about just add two, right? Um, and, and that's another way to do it. Okay. But now once you get to some stranger things, like say, um, uh, how about add three, subtract one, right? And then add three, subtract one, add three, subtract one. Okay. Could you, could you, um, add six, subtract six, then add two, right? Could you multiply by 19, divide by 19, add one, subtract one, <laughs> you know, and, and, and then add two, right? I mean, like, yes, you could do all of those things, right? Could, and so now you're thinking, once you think that way, you think, okay, I guess, I guess the sequence two, four, six, eight, et cetera, could be generated by basically an infinite number of different rules. It's just that some of those rules are pretty complicated. Okay, now imagine that the sequence continued so that we have more evidence than as we have more experience, we have a, a, a longer sequence, right? And that, that can rule some things out, it seems like, right? So consider, imagine the sequence goes 2, 4, 6, 8, 13, okay? Well, look, I mean, so already there's there's a, a, some, you know, plenty of, plenty of rules that could, um, that could generate both of these. Uh, say, for example, pick any number larger than the last one, right? But you might say, all right, how many different <coughs> uh, uh, how many different rules could have produced this sequence two four six eight thirteen? And again, they're going to have to be some fairly complex rules. But but you might say, okay, well, count by twos for the first four, and then you know then start counting by fives. Right, that could do it. Um, how about uh, you know so you know add three, subtract one. Uh, for the first four times, uh, then you add, uh, a, you know, nine and subtract, you know, one or nine and subtract, I guess, four, right? Um, or, or, you know, or whatever, <laughs> you know, um, and, and, and again, you can just, you know, have a term, some essentially an infinite number of rules that could have generated this sequence. Okay, well, what happens if we add even more evidence, right? Um, how many, uh, how many things could could generate the the you know like two four six eight thirteen you know twenty twenty two or something like that right it's like oh well you know uh, again it seems like no matter how much evidence we have no matter how many observations we make of the way the world is when we say okay what sort of rules could could there be to account for what we saw and the answer seems like it 
kind of has to be some infinite number of different rules, um, uh, even th even though some of those rules are much more complicated than others. And the question is, if you want to say, well, you know, gosh, you know, the, the rules can't be too complicated. Well, can't they? Right. W what should the universe care about what seems simple to us? Um, there's, 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 there doesn't seem to be any reason why, um, why any simple rule has to be any better than any complex rule in terms of being more likely to be true. We, we certainly like simple rules better than complex rules, but that doesn't mean they're, they're guaranteed to be the case. All right. And no, you know, um, there's just no, no reason for, for, for that thought. And so that's what we mean when we say that the formula that is the rule that could produce one of these things is underdetermined by the sequence. No matter how long we make the sequence, you still end up with an infinite number of rules that could have generated that sequence. And so no matter how much experience we have, by analogy, we have an infinite number of different natural laws that could have accounted for that experience. And that's a, that's a real problem. It means that perhaps our evidence, that is our inductive method here, doesn't actually do anything after all despite the fact that we sure think it does. So one more example of this, that's, you know, a, a real example of, you know, an actual problem that, that, that is dealt with sometimes is what's called a, a curve fitting problem, right? So again, imagine you've got these, like, um, these, these sort of, uh, uh, blue data points, right? Um, well, if you're going to draw a line that just kind of, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, that goes through at least some of the points and sort of near the others and say, okay, this is, this is the line that sort of, you know, that this is the trend that the data points actually represent, right? Notice that's a little bit arbitrary. And in fact, this one doesn't fit, doesn't fit very well. If you tilt it, it fits better. Okay. And if you make it curvy, it fits even better. That is, it gets even closer on average to each of these points. But notice the line that fits perfectly, that goes exactly through each of these points is this line, <laughs> okay? Um, and you're like, okay, well, w which one represents a fact about the world? Which way is the red line really? And the point is, the evidence is just as good, offers just as good a support for for each of these, uh, for each of these. In fact, in, in a way, it offers the best support for this this one. But of course, how many different lines that go all like directly through all of these points could you make that are that are they're way different? Like, imagine one goes down this way, then up this way. Like maybe the exact reverse of of this line. Notice, right? Um, <laughs> and and uh, you know, you're just you know, boing, boing, right? You know, or just one that sort of, you know, boing, 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 boing. I mean, imagine a line that does that or one that does it below that, right? Some of the dips are big, some of the dips are teeny, or some of the lines are straight, some of the lines are curved between one point and the other. And, and it looks like when if you're going to make, right, a curve that actually perfectly fits it into the, all these data points, you can make an infinite number of different looking curves in order to do that. It's like, well, okay, can you fix that problem by adding more data points? No, you can't, <laughs> right? Because again, uh, there's always space between the data points and the shape of the curve between those data points is always underdetermined by where the data points are. Adding more points, more points, more points just doesn't make that go away, right? And so this is what's called a curve fitting problem. And it's a problem that in some sense runs right into Goodman's new riddle of induction. Um, there's another way of, of, of thinking about it, right? So uh, if you want to say, you know, a, a graph some particular thing you could use what's called a linear scale and in fact uh that's that's what you know a, a certain relationship would look like on on a, on a on a on a linear scale but on a logarithmic scale it looks like this okay and so if you know which is the right scale which is the real shape of this line well they both are right it just depends on how you on, on on what reason and the reasons for choosing one of these things versus the other are largely arbitrary but they make they make the line look different um so yeah. Uh, and so for, for, for a, a real example of this, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Laffer curve, uh, which is, uh, it had it had a history uh, back in the day. This was a thing that economists and, and sort of politicians argued about. Uh, basically what, what the Laffer curve is, is is it has on this horizontal axis a, a, a tax rate, right? And uh, this is a kind of hypothetical argument, right? Uh, and then there's on the vertical axis tax revenue. And so the end points of this of this line are very clear, right? That if 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 there if the tax rate was zero, the revenue would also be zero. 
And that only makes sense. If you're not charging any taxes, you can't collect any taxes. And so your revenue is, is tax revenue is zero, right? That's very clear. Everybody agrees that with a 0% tax rate, your revenue would be zero, right? Likewise, people suspect that, right? If your tax rate were 100%, Right, your revenue would probably also be zero, and that, that's just just a you know in in the abstract sense, right? So the idea is if no matter what somebody did, everything that they earned had to be collected in taxes, well, people just wouldn't do anything, right? Or certainly wouldn't do anything in a way that was in any way taxable, right? And so then again, uh, in that sense, the revenue would be zero, right? And so then the idea is that you say, well, well, there's there's a point you know, here where, um, you know, where, where charging a higher tax rate actually decreases the amount of revenue rather than increases it. Uh, this argument was very popular in the, uh, in, in the United States in the 1980s during the Reagan administration. And uh, the argument that uh, a lot of people who supported, you know, sort of widespread, you know, tax cuts and things like that, the, the argument they made was that, well, the Laffer, you know, they, they used the Laffer curve here, which is made named for an economist whose last name was Laffer, right? Um, and uh, the... It's actually, now that I think about it, it possibly wasn't an economist, but was instead uh, a government official or staff or something like that. I just don't remember. You can look it up and uh, and probably learn something. I'll probably look it up later. Uh, but in any case, it was named after a person. Um, but the argument was this. They, they were like, well, no, 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 we're already at a place where, like, you know, if we if we drop the tax rate, right, you know, we're already somewhere over here. So if we drop the rate, we'll, we'll actually increase our revenue because the big criticism of dropping the tax rate is that well, we are going to decrease your tax revenue so much that the government's not going to be able to do the, the, you know, perform its essential services. You know, it's not going to be able to fund, you know, the kinds of things that it just has to in order to continue to exist. Um, but, of course, the trouble is that it's a curve fitting problem. Right? Again, we, we agree about the endpoints. We agree that if the rate's high enough, that, that the revenue would be zero. And we agree that if the rate's low enough, the revenue is zero. Uh, but we have n no agreement as to what happens before then. Right? You could you could have all kinds of reasonable things for thinking that either A, like this red line here, that it's really steep. Right? It's, it's really steep up front and has this long trailing edge. That is, the idea is that as the, the, the tax rate increases marginally, like a little bit, you, you know, the, the revenue really increases right? because people don't change their, their behavior at all. And then as it passes a certain point and gets higher, people slowly sort of change their behavior and do less and less and less that, that is taxable uh, because they're disincentivized by the, by the high tax rate or something like that. Right? And so, uh, or, or it could be really shallow. That is that people will put up with rather high tax rates before they actually start getting disincentivized. And then once they do, it falls off quickly, right? So it could be like this blue line, right? That really could be what the Laffer curve looks like, or it could be sort of this classic, you know, sort of symmetrical curve. Like we have, we have absolutely no idea what it looks like. And in fact, uh, some political cartoonists uh, joked that maybe it looks like this. Um, and that's, you know, uh, of course, not an actual sort of curve. It loops over on itself and various things like that. It's, but it's that you get the point, right? Uh, that this is a curve fitting problem. So you might be, again, agreed upon two points, but there's just an, 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 a, a near infinite number, if not an actual infinite number of ways that it really could look in between one and the other. That is, it, we may not even have these smooth lines at all. It may be that there are there are stair steps in here where things will sort of flatten and then and then jump and then flatten and then jump, uh, or, or that some uh, tax rates will end up having higher revenue uh, and then a dip, and then it'll go up even higher, and then maybe a dip even lower, and then maybe an increase, and then all the way down. So like, again, that may be how, how, how reality works, and it may not be something you can even theoretically predict. It may some, be something that's just specific to each given society at each given time uh, uh, that, you know, what the hypothetical tax rate would be and how, what, what that would return in terms of tax revenue. So um, again, the, the Laffer curve or, or deciding how much, you know, uh, how much revenue would result from what kind of a tax rate, that's another kind of a curve fitting problem. And it seems like even if we had an, an infinite amount of data uh, in any given case, we couldn't really determine what it actually looks like because we can't you know just like what we can't do is we can't take a society and then put the same like you know put a, a variety of tax rates on it right uh, all at the same time and then see what happened uh, it's just it's not it's just not even conceptually feasible um, and even so you'd have each tax rate is a point right uh, uh, on, on this graph and who, so who knows what the curve actually looks like that connects each of those points together no matter how many points there are 
And so again, this is truly a, 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 an example of a real actual curve fitting problem, which is an example of a real actual uh, problem that runs right into Goodman's new riddle of induction. And uh, that should tell you it really is it really is a problem. And the, these aren't the only kinds of problems that it has. And the upshot is that if you take it, the argument as seriously as it deserves, you're going to have some very, very, very serious doubts about what your experience actually does confirm in terms of law-like statements, right? Uh, it seems like every law-like statement could have any, it could, could, you know, and it could have some evidence that supports it, but that exact evidence could support any number of different law-like statements. And so again, what good is, is the evidence if it, if it, if it could support some indefinite number of different alternatives. Uh, so uh, the problem that, that uh, drives Goodman's new rule of induction is this kind of underdetermination. So if that's not vaguely uh, disturbing to you, it sh it should be, right? Uh, in fact, that might, you know, I, 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 in my view, this ought to be heavily disturbing uh, if you're if you're taking the argument seriously enough and thinking it through. Um, and so uh, that's where where I'll leave you for this time with this highly disturbing problem. Uh, and uh, the next time uh, for the next uh, uh, lecture. I'll, I'll let you guess uh, based on your past experience, and we'll see what that's worth, uh, whether I'm going to present a solution to this problem or whether I'm simply going to present a different and potentially worse problem.